Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Brian Morescu. Brian initially trained as a classicist, gaining a degree in Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit from Brown University. And since then, as a member of the New York Bar, he's been practicing law internationally for 15 years. In 2016, he became the founding executive director of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, whose work has been featured by CNN, ESPN, Vice, and the Washington Post. In arbitration with NFL, he represented the first professional athlete in the US to request therapeutic use exemption for cannabis. Alongside this work, he's been engaged in a quest for over a decade to prove that the original Christian sacrament was a psychedelic potion inherited from the ancient Greeks. This is a subject of his new book, The Immortality Key, The Secret History of the Religion with No Name, and it's what we talk about today. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, I'm here with Brian Morescu. Brian, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, James. So you've written this excellent book, The Immortality Key, um, and maybe we can start with your background and how it is you came to write this book. So I started with a relatively useless major in Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, and was supposed to either go to seminary or become a classics professor, and neither of those worked out. So I went to law school and practiced law. I'm still practicing law, actually, uh, for the past 15 years. Uh, but eventually, I couldn't quite leave the mysteries behind. So this was kind of my, my nights and weekends, Indiana Jones, one-man hunt uh, for the scientific evidence to prove the best-kept secret in history. <laughs> and you, am I right that this got sparked by reading about the Hopkins research into psilocybin and the way it helps people overcome fear of death when they have terminal, terminal cancer? Exactly. I mean, it's, it's a true story. In, in 2007, I'm sitting on the 57th floor of my, my law firm building a block from Wall Street, and I pick up The Economist, and there's this, this you know, short article called The God Pill about some of the early experiments at Johns Hopkins University with psilocybin. And in there was that crazy stat about two thirds of the volunteers claiming it was among the most meaningful experiences of their lives. And even at that, at that moment, I knew there was something. And turns out all these years later, that stat is now 75%, believe it or not. If you talk to Roland Griffiths at Hopkins, he will tell you that three in four people who go through one of these um, clinically controlled trials with psilocybin will wind up describing it as either the single most meaningful experience of their lives or among the top five. And when, when you see something like that, uh, you can draw several conclusions or speculations. And for me, I went straight back to the ancient world. Uh, th this, this whole hunt for ancient intoxicants was not my hunt. There's been a lot of crazy theories out there since at least the 1970s uh, and probably before. Uh, but when I, when I saw that kind of psychopharmacology that was investigating these states of awareness, I figured, you know, here's, here's something, here's a new break in the case. Right. And so in these experiments, you have people taking these high doses, they experience what might be called ego disillusion, right? And, and they have this kind of religious experience that, that relates to death and rebirth. And, and it's this, this profound spiritual experience. And I guess for you, did you, you saw this uh, as hearkening to uh, parallels in Christianity in, or in religion in general, as well as in, in the ancient world? Because the book is about the idea that the Christian sacrament might have been something comparable, right? Right, so that, that's part of the book. So I spend the entire second half of the book um, investigating paleo-Christianity. But the first thing I thought of was Eleusis, because this, this volunteer testimony <clears throat> struck me as, as very similar to some of the testimony that survived from the ancient world about Eleusis which for those who don't know is kind of the spiritual capital of the ancient Mediterranean. It lasts for about 2000 years from 1500, give or take BC to the fourth century AD when it's obliterated under the Christianized Roman empire. But it included initiates, uh, everyone from Plato, Pindar, Sophocles to Marcus Aurelius centuries later. And you know, because everything was secret, there's only so much uh, that we can infer from what was happening there. But we do know that some kind of vision and Carl Cadenyi, gold standard uh, scholar of the classics calls it the beatific vision. I mean, actually using the language from Christianity, like you just mentioned, because whatever was happening there was something profound and transformative. It was a once in a lifetime event, also very similar to the experiments at Hopkins, a one and only intervention. And folks like everyone from Plato to Marcus Aurelius walked away claiming they'd become gods, that they had this beatific vision and they were guaranteed some kind of afterlife from this one and only intervention. And so for me, the first thing I thought about when I was reading that article, The God Pill, was, was Eleusis and it was off from there. Right. And so I guess your argument, as you say, is kind of in two parts, right? You have the first part is 
well, was there something, was there some substance that was psychedelic in some sense producing these beatific visions in ancient Greece? And then is it plausible that the early, the, the Christian sacrament that we now have is, you know, the bread and wine was some, some carryover from that, right? Some, some kind of carrying on that tradition of some, some kind of spiked wine. Right, exactly. Th those are the two big questions I'm, I'm trying to answer. Um, and what was happening in 2007, 2008 already is I was seeing some of the, the psychopharmacology investigate this. And as, as, a, as a good practicing lawyer, I'm the first one to say that the, that evidence is circumstantial at best, you know, but it is an interesting clue as to what happens in the mind on these substances because our neurochemistry hasn't changed in the past 2000 years let alone the past 20,000 or 200,000. So if, if, if it's happening today, it's, it's a little clue to what may have been happening a couple thousand years ago, but there was this other science that was kind of coming online. At least it was, it was new for me. And it's a still a relatively new discipline, archeochemistry. And, and these are folks going out into the field, into excavations, finding chalices, cups, containers, vessels, et cetera, uh, testing them. Uh, with a battery of high-tech instrumentation, including gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and all this wonky stuff. But the point of it is that they're finding uh, things. They're, they're, they're finding trace elements of what our ancestors actually consumed in antiquity, which is, uh, again, another break in the case and a relatively new science that is, is putting some meat onto the bones of what, is, what was otherwise high speculation. I mean, I, I think informed speculation, uh, but, but, but speculation nonetheless from 40 years ago. And now we have the science to attack this stuff, which for me uh, is, is super exciting. Right. And so if we think about before these new techniques like archaeochemistry, um, I guess in the 60s, people were, and ever since ancient times, people have been re relying on written accounts, right? So we have in, you know, you study Sanskrit as well as these kind of European languages, and you write about how Soma in the Rig Veda, you know, some of the, old, of the oldest religious texts we have, are perhaps the first indication that there's some kind of psychedelic potion being used in, in religious contexts. Is that right? It's possible. And, and it's very, very controversial. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't want to speculate too much about Soma, but I'm, I wouldn't be the first person to do so. Uh, Calvert Watkins at Harvard did so in the same year uh, that the Road to Eleusis was released in 1978. You know, people have questions about about these mixed potions, and 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 their use, and and, and why they came along, how they survived, how they were applied over time. Uh, you know, the the soma has been compared by scholars like this to the kukion, which was the the ritual sacrament used in the Eleusinian mysteries for 2,000 years. And again, you can make uh, not not too far of a leap to the Christian Eucharist. Uh, this, this idea of, of a sacrament that is supposed to provide some kind of communion with the god or the goddess or the gods and, and safeguard uh, some kind of immortality. I mean, it's, it's very, very clear from the Gospels that the Eucharist is an immortality potion and nothing less. And I spent a lot of time talking about the Gospel of John, and we won't fast forward to it, but I mean, just to use one very quick line in Greek, in John 6, 56, Jesus says, whoever drinks my blood... Uh, you know, remains in me and I in, and I in them. Basically, we become one. And that idea uh, was there in Eleusis. It was very much present in the mysteries of Dionysus. Uh, so we're, there were lots of Greek pagan mystery traditions that seemed to have survived into the Christian era. Right. It's worth lingering on that point, I think, because this is the immortality key of the title of the book, right? This, um, the fact that it produces this it has this strange relationship to death and in the Hopkins studies, as you say, people feeling that death is no longer a problem. Um, and I think it can be hard maybe for people to wrap their heads around if they've not had these experiences. But, you know, I think there's a sense of ego dissolution going from feeling like you are this limited personality to identifying with something much greater. You might call it God or the universe or, you know, but some reality or just reality itself being far bigger than you. Um, and the, if you identify with being, then the thing that you are, the thing that matters will continue after the individual ego dies, right? And, and you write very eloquently about ego dissolution for someone who I don't think has ever <laughs> had the experience themselves, right? <laughs> but that, that is exactly the point. Uh, and I'm, I'm having a lot of fun talking about that because people can't believe I'm a psychedelic mm -hmm. virgin, but that's actually the whole point of my book. It's why I start the book. And in fact, the key in the immortality key does not refer to drugs 
or psychedelics. The, the way I define that key to immortality is that ego disillusion, myriad ways to make that happen. And I, I start the book with the, with the phrase in Greek, which can be found at the Mount Athos Monastery, uh, the holiest site in, in Greek Orthodoxy. And it, it's, um, it's, if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. And that has nothing to do with drugs per se, but it, it is this, this sense of ego dissolution that certainly survived into the Greek Orthodox Church, and I argue represents a legacy from antiquity. The Greeks were obsessed with death by any means possible. And Plato, although he was an initiate, um, in the Phaedo, for example, he defines philosophy as, you know, those who engage with it in the right way, uh, true philosophy is nothing else but dying and being dead. Again, nothing to do with drugs per se, but in the Greek world, in and outside the mysteries, there were these, um, I guess what Eliade would say, these archaic techniques of ecstasy to, to confront, to overcome death, whether that's meditation, fasting, uh, just lying dead in a cave for three days. Uh, you know, we, the, 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 these experiences seem to, um, they seem to arise. The, these visionary experiences seem to arise. The, the human body and our neurochemistry seems to give rise to these experiences. And sometimes it does happen naturally. Yeah. And so if we turn to the pre-Christian world of, of ancient Greece um, that you've kind of prefigured, you have this, you have Eleusis, this kind of, this city that's, you know, I guess the kind of Mecca or, you know, whatever analogy you want to use as this religious center. Um, and this, this deeply mysterious ritual. Um, and so you write about it being, it, before we get onto the kind of the, the potion, the cookie on and whether it's psychedelic, is it fairly um, uncontroversial to say that it was some kind of fertility, right? Some kind of harvest festival? I think there were overtones of that for sure. I mean, even uh, Jane Ellen Harrison writes about this uh, in the 19th into the 20th century. I, I think that, that, that was in fact, that was the running hypothesis is that these are fertility rites. And you know, uh, for those who don't know, the, the rites of Eleusis were essentially dedicated to Demeter and Persephone, right? The goddess of the grain and her daughter who's abducted to the underworld by Hades. And we have like, for example, the hymn to Demeter which survives from seventh century BC more or less. And it's kind of an origin tale for how these mysterious rites landed at Eleusis and, and baked into all of it is essentially a seasonal myth. Um, you know, uh, Persephone is abducted before she's released by Hades because Demeter is pissed and she sends drought throughout the land. Uh, but before Demeter, uh, Persephone is released, a pomegranate seed is forced down her throat, beckoning her back to the underworld for a certain period of time. So it's, it's, it's used as an, ex, an explanation for the seasonal cycles, basically. And with that, lots of, lots of fertility. When Persephone comes back, it's springtime, the flowers are blossoming, Demeter's happy, everything's fine. When Persephone goes back to the underworld, there's your winter, the death of the crops. And so it's kind of an obvious fertility cycle. And Eleusis itself was the site of this, uh, this grain uh, this this uh, grain storage. Uh, so all the communities around Greece uh, would send their first fruits over to Eleusis for, for storage there. And, and to this day, there's a gigantic granary that if, if you take a visit, the excavator will, will show you. I mean, so clearly uh, it had something to do with the cereal crops and life and death of the fields and, and also with us. That, that was the running assumption for a long time. Right. And I think it's um, the idea, you know, on the one hand, you might say you have fertility rites and, and harvest festivals. And on the other hand, you have these kind of deeply religious mysteries of death and rebirth. But to me, they seem to almost be two sides of the same thing, you know, winter and like the wheel of the year is a kind of cyclical death rebirth cycle. So it makes sense to me that it, it's not contradictory, I guess, to say it could simultaneously be a kind of fertility harvest festival and something of profound religious um, importance. And the, the kind of that side of it, the mystery of death and rebirth I guess that's maybe where the, the kukion comes in. And before the archaeochemistry, we had written kind of uh, evidence of the ingredients, right? Right, so it's in the same hymn to Demeter that I, that I mentioned. In addition to this origin myth about the abduction of Persephone and Demeter's mad hunt for her daughter over nine days and nights, she lands at what would become the holy site of Eleusis. And the king and queen offer her a refreshment. They give her a glass of wine, actually. And she says, no, she's not a wine lady. She, she's a beer lady. She's the lady of the grain. 
And so she lists out the ingredients for this beverage, which becomes known as the kukion, which in Greek just means a mixed beverage. But the things that were mixed into it to produce this thing uh, in Greek were left with uh, water, uh, barley, and mint. And we don't know what that means, but if you take a step back, it kind of reads like a very rudimentary recipe for beer, if you think about it, or a minty beer. I went and I, and I talked to a beer scientist in Munich, Germany about this, Martin Zarnkow. Uh, so we're not sure what to make of it, but because Eleusis itself um, is secret, right? And you think about ancient Greece, the society that produces all this wonderful literature, and yet here is this secret mystery tradition where nothing is written down. It was a conscious throwback to prehistory. Uh, it was a conscious retention of oral tradition and these ancient rites, again, for a civilization that now we associate with wine, but at the time they were, they were hanging on to this, to this archaic beer of, of sorts. Uh, beer itself, which can be traced back another 10,000 years before that potentially. And I spend a lot of time in the book tracing this, this beer sacrament and this religion of brewing all the way from Anatolia into Greece and the rest of Europe in the Neolithic period, which is, is nerdy and interesting to me, maybe no one else. But the point is, uh, this, this beverage has a long history behind it. And for the longest time, again, that's all we had were those three ingredients. Yeah, and it makes sense to me that, um, you know, you're saying for, for a culture that's, that's known for writing and wine, you have this ritual that nothing's written about it and it's, and it's beer. Um, I heard you say in, a, in another podcast, and it's a great point, and it, it makes sense to me, I guess, that with civilization, you have almost a pulling away from nature, pulling away from the natural cycles, but that you might want to retain some, something that reminds you you're part of the ebb and flow of, of the natural world, which seems to, it seems to tick those kinds of boxes. Um, and then, I guess, maybe next we turn to The Road to Eleusis, this, this book that was, it, remember, right, it was the first one to, to posit the idea that the Kukion might be psychedelic in some way? I think it was the first... Uh, the first one that went viral, maybe. Uh, okay. there, there was Robert Graves before that. Uh, Wasson had been speculating before that. Um, and Carl Kadenyi, who I mentioned, it's funny, he actually had some correspondence with Albert Elfman in the 60s about this. But in 1978, all these threads come together in The Road to Eleusis, uh, co-authored by R. Gordon Wasson, the former J.P. Morgan banker turned ethnomycologist, and Albert Hoffman, who of course discovers LSD in 1938, and Carl Ruck, uh, who I cataloged throughout the book, and the only surviving member of this trio. He's now 85 years old and still at Boston University, like he was 42 years ago. And together, uh, these renegades come up with this idea. And, and I think it follows on, on Hoffman's experimentation with, with ergot. Now, uh, ergot is this naturally occurring fungus that can infect the cereal grains. It's, it's more common on rye, but it does happen on barley. And so when, when Wasson, Hoffman, and Ruck got together, and you're looking at those three ingredients in this kukion, they really focused on the alfi in Greek, the, the barley. And to them, alfi is kind of a code word. It doesn't really mean barley. It meant barley infected with ergot, again, which is very common, naturally occurring, and the very same ergot that Hoffman uh, used to synthesize LSD. And, and his thinking uh, in, in a Swiss chemist mind is, is that if I could do this accidentally, because remember, Hoffman was not looking for LSD. So his thinking is, if I did this accidentally, is it impossible that somebody 2,000 years ago or more could have stumbled onto the same kind of chemistry? And again, really interesting idea, very hard to prove scientifically in 1978. So it's not very well received by the Academy. Yeah. And so you have, I mean, these, these people are really um, giants in the field of psychedelics. You have Gordon Wasson as well, against the, the guy who first identified, well, first took uh, magic mushrooms from Mexico to the West, right? And then gave them to Albert Hoffman and he became the first person to synthesize psilocybin. And I remember when I first heard about the road to Eleusis, my gut instinct was, well, why would it be ergot rather than mushrooms? You know, these guys know, know about mushrooms. They're, they seem to be readily available. But then when you read about, you know, the fact that, I mean, agriculture, you have grain and ergot such a widely, you know, found fungus and did, am I right that Hoffman uh, tried some of these ergot's alkaloids that are like LSD, like tried them on himself as well and found they were psychedelic? Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the, the funnest moments of my research was sitting in the Wasson archives, um, which has attracted kind of this cult following, but it's this beautiful, massive collection that's held in the Harvard Herbaria there at the very end of Divinity Avenue next to the Harvard Divinity School. Uh, and I sat in there for hours looking through uh, Wasson's correspondences with lots of different people. I mean, he's, what a fascinating guy he was. 
1976, I found this letter that Albert Hoffman had written him from, from Switzerland saying that he had self-dosed because that's what Hoffman did. He had self-dosed with ergonavine, uh, which is one of these many, many alkaloids present in ergot. And at the time, they were talking about like 30 different alkaloids. Um, some of them potentially visionary, some of them quite toxic, um, which is another interesting uh, and key fact about this hypothesis because ergot, you know, uh, it tends to result in not very pleasant experiences. Like, like gangrene and convulsions and trembling. And we have lots of uh, ergot outbreaks, ergotism throughout the Middle Ages and even into the 20th century. So I, it always struck me as a weird hypothesis. And then I found this letter that Hoffman wrote to his colleagues saying that he'd, he'd self-dosed and found it to be five to 10 times uh, more effective than psilocybin, uh, which is, I mean, you were talking about a pretty potent substance here. And Hoffman himself did not report anything unpleasant. And he sent some samples along in the mail to Wasson, hoping Wasson would also self-experiment. And instead of doing that, he gave it to Carl Ruck uh, to see what would happen. And Carl, unfortunately, did not uh, enter the land of marmalade trees. Uh, so we're not sure what you know, Hoffman did, why it was so effective on him. But uh, we have his word for it. Right. And I guess, yeah, the idea is that they would have had some way of, of modifying the potion so that it would be less toxic and, and more psychedelic perhaps. Um, and then with, with Ruck's career, right, it he took a real impact because of the modern bias, right? the war on drugs happening at the time. And, and you, you met him as well, right? During the research of your book. I hung out with Carl uh, a few times. We had a, I went to visit him in his beautiful home in Hull, Massachusetts, maybe an hour south of Boston. Again, where he's still a, a professor at Boston University. And, you know, I'd, I'd read The Road to Eleusis when I was an undergrad, and because there just wasn't much rigorous scholarship on the use of drugs in antiquity, there wasn't, you know, much, much to follow up on. And so I left it there, not because it was like scandalous for me in the late 90s or early 2000s, and I talked to my professors about it. Nobody was really scandalized. There just wasn't a lot, of, a lot there until I started reading all this psychopharmacology in 2007, 2008. But again, think, think back to 1978. Carl's this young chair of the classics department. Wasson and Hoffman were older and basically retired uh, and had not much to lose. And, I, and as I write in the book, Carl had everything to lose and he lost it hard. You know, his career took a serious nosedive. This is controversial stuff. He's claiming that the founders of Western civilization uh, were high on drugs when they drafted these blueprints for everything that we take advantage of today from democracy and the arts and sciences, et cetera. It's, it's a crazy idea not to back up with the scientific data. Uh, so he became, again, what I say is kind of like the, the black sheep of the classics estate. No, nobody's out there writing about drugs, except Carl's never stopped. You know, he launched the road to Eleusis and just, and just doubled down on being the, the, the drug guy. And he's still writing about it. So you should all go to his website and look at his, his CV. It's just, it's incredible. His output is, is phenomenal. Uh, so uh, that, that's what happened. And in the absence of scientific data, you know, he slowly retreated from, from his colleagues. Uh, he was cut off from graduate students. Um, there wasn't much interdisciplinary scholarship happening in the 80s and 90s, et cetera. And, uh, and I saw this as an opportunity to take a fresh look at everything he'd been accumulating for most of his career. Yeah, it's incredible. In, in the absence of, of hard evidence, if you just rely on kind of speculation, I think the perspective of modern Western society that's very anti anti drug versus the perspective of imagining, you know, the fact that indigenous communities all over the world seem to engage in plant based shamanism, engaging with altered states seem to be seems to be a very kind of intrinsic part of being human. And I think from that perspective, if you're speculating, you can either see it as a crazy beyond the pale theory or as something well, of course, there would be continuity of you know, you go from having drugs to having these potions and it would get carried on in some way. Um, I think that's just interesting to keep in mind that, you know, you can have those two different No, I, I agree. I agree. As a matter of fact, I was surprised. I've mentioned Carl Kedigny a couple of times. I'll mention somebody else, Walter Burkert, uh, who around the same, or a year before, 1977, released kind of gold standard scholarship on this. It's come into English as Greek religion is his famous textbook. It was translated by uh, in the 80s and released by Harvard University Press. But it was uh, this, this massive tome released in German in the late 70s, Grekische Religion die Achaiusen und Klassischen Epoche. And in there, uh, which, I mean, you, you know, the, the, there's, there's one line in there that just really stuck out at me. 
And Walter Berker, you know, not a drug guy, uh, is essentially speculating and saying that, is it possible that Eleusis and these other mystery cults, these fertility rites, uh, harken back to something from deep prehistory, when there was a drug sacrament, right? When, when there was something potent and active, and that by the time it got to the classical Greeks, maybe it had been forgotten and replaced, he says, by a harmless substance, but that at some point, it was the kind of ritual that guaranteed, how, what does he say? Like access to a psychedelic beyond. I mean, all this like beautiful poetic German language. Uh, so, I mean, even to someone like him, it's, it, it, it's not a crazy idea. So I never really understood why, why Carl's career was so impacted when you have these other scholars out there openly speculating about this. And in some cases, even talking to Albert Hoffman about this, like it just never really made sense to me, which is why I wanted to go out there and talk to uh, the top classicist in the world at Harvard about this, which I did, and, and the top biblical scholars and the top excavators and the curators at the Louvre, et cetera. Because I think if, if we just approach this without that bias that, I mean, your intuition, I think was my intuition is that uh, it's, this doesn't seem crazy at first blush. Yeah, and so you, you picked up this thread, right, of the hypothesis and you actually went to Eleusis, right, in an attempt to, to test the, the cups. <laughs> another another fun moment with with Puffy Papangeli, who I love. She what, what an amazing person. She's been on site there for decades. Uh, she is the keeper of the mysteries, as I put it. Uh, and funny and open minded. And uh, I'm there for an hour with her on site. She agrees to see me from one night to the next morning, and we have a great conversation. Um, and I impress her with my ancient Greek, or I fail to impress her with my ancient Greek, and, and we're there talking, and, and, I, and I say, uh, I can't believe that nobody has just ever asked her, given archaeochemistry and given all these people, uh, like Andrew Coe at MIT and his colleagues who are doing serious science on this stuff, why has nobody ever asked her to test these vessels? Because I know they've excavated tons of, of cups and chalices, and we even have a name for it in Greek. It's called the Kernos. The Kernos is, is, was very unique. It's a very uniquely shaped vessel uh, that, that was excavated on site there, and we found them elsewhere. I won't, I won't spoil the, the surprise for you now, but it's kind of like this, it's this central cup with mini cups around the outside. Again, it, it points to some kind of mixed beverage or, or potion, and when I finally asked her the question I'd been dying to ask her for like a decade, her response was that unfortunately her chalices, her cups had been treated for conservation purposes. And so there was no longer any um, active alkaloids or compounds or organic material in these. So uh, Eleusis itself was an unfortunate dead end. Right, and so with that dead end, if we kind of zoom out and rewind, um, you've, you've already mentioned this, this kind of idea that beer um, was, was kind of primary before wine came along, beer was, was what it was about with these potions. And you write about the, the idea that beer, rather than bread, is why we started with agriculture, right? Beer is, it, it may have been that these, these intoxicating potions and these experiences of altered states might have been what birthed settled life and ultimately civilization in the end. It's, it's possible. It's, and that's why, as a good lawyer, I can't say dispositively <laughs> what, but there, there's, there's this really interesting debate that's been happening, I think, since the 50s. Uh, if you look it up, it's referred to as the sour braidwood debate. And the, the basic question is, which came first, right? Um, what, 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 is, what is humankind's oldest biotechnology? Is it beer or bread? And when I sat down with uh, Martin Zarnkow, this beer scientist in Munich, uh, he kind of led me through and opened my eyes to an interesting way of looking at it. It's, it's actually much easier to brew beer than to bake bread because, first of all, you don't need any heat. You don't need any temperature to brew beer. That, that's a relatively recent uh, innovation um, from the Industrial Revolution or around the industrialization of brewing um, after the Reformation. Uh, it's before that, he says, you know, to brew beer, you take some crops, you throw it in some water, and that's it. You don't even need yeast. In fact, it probably happened by accident through the microbiome on the human skin, which is different from men to women, by the way, and a very important point. Uh, but he basically told me it's, it's, it's shockingly easy to brew beer. Uh, uh, which, which is really surprising to me. I'm, not only that, he's out there looking for evidence, like any good scientist. And so he was involved in a study from, I think it was published in 2012, uh, from Gobekli Tepe, uh, universally, or at least sometimes referred to as the world's first temple. I think it was the Smithsonian, uh, had a great cover article a few years ago. And it's this giant megalithic site 
from 12,000 years ago when it's not supposed to be there. Uh, this is 6,000 years before Stonehenge, 7,000 years before the high civilizations in Egypt and elsewhere. Uh, and we have this giant henge, I mean, this giant megalithic architecture. And in there, there were troughs and barrels that uh, with mixed results, he was able to test positive for calcium oxalate, which is one of these biomarkers of beer fermentation. 12,000 years ago, uh, potentially before bread, uh, at this religious site, at this sanctuary. And so it elevates the concept of beer from, you know, a bar drink to something very sacred, uh, which is why I spend so much time investigating it. Because if, if, if beer was the thing that took us from the caves to the cities, clearly there was religious significance behind it uh, and something going on that has been lost to us over time. Right. Yeah. And as you say, rather than it just being a beer you might relax with, there's, I guess, evidence that, again, with this link to death, you, you read about these graveyard beers, you know, this, this correlation between, um, yeah, like the, the idea that maybe beer was spiked with substances that made it truly potent in a way more than alcohol might be, might be potent. That's my hypothesis. I, I don't see how, what, what do I say in the book? I don't see how a lukewarm Budweiser <laughs> of like 3% alcohol is going to convince people to build this giant architecture and travel from miles around, by the way. This was a pilgrimage site, Gobekli Tepe. Uh, it, was, it was not used as, as a residence. And so this, this stuff was built. This community was emboldened on this communal project uh, to do what the German Archaeological Institute, the respected institute, says. Uh, had, had something to do with religion, had something to do with a death cult, which is why I coined the phrase the graveyard beer. Maybe that was involved because this is what the, the German archaeologists are telling us, that the, they found skulls, for example, with holes drilled into the parietal bone. Uh, uh, it kind of, it, it indicates a skull being used as this object of veneration and being hung at some point in the sanctuary as a way to interact with the dead. Uh, and we're, we're here, I'm, I'm on holiday in Uruguay right now, celebrating the Day of the Dead. Uh, and you know, this, it, it seems that this, this whole notion of the living ancestors um, uh, interacting with those who came before uh, was there from a, perhaps a very long time ago and probably much further than that. Right, and so then if we, if we come back to to the Greek uh, period where you have all over the Mediterranean, you have these brewing practices, presumably spiking things with, you know, for rituals. And you have, you write about, um, you know, uh, Triptolemus, this, this figure who was supposed to spread, who was thought to spread grain in agriculture, but also um, evidence of, of people, of Demeter being, you know, this, this deity is revered across the, the Greek world. And then you find this real smoking gun evidence uh, in my opinion, of, of Ergot being involved in, in the Kikion, right? Right. I, I won't quite use that word as a good lawyer, mm -hmm. but I say I think it is, it is the most compelling data I've seen uh, in my lifetime to substantiate what was an otherwise crazy hypothesis from 1978, that the whole concept of ergotized beer. Um, we've never found ergotized beer, and so it, just, it, it exists in the abstract. Um, so what, I took it upon myself to go through these archaeobotany journals uh, for years and years and years and eventually started Googling the term ergot in different languages because I know there's a bunch of words in German, for example. I go through them in the book like aftakon and mutakon, taltenkon, tolkon, uh, crazy corn. Uh, and so no, knowing that and the, the I guess, the, the lore that exists around ergot, I tried a bunch of different languages, tried it in Spanish, which is Cornezuela de Centeno, and bit by bit, I found this archaeological site, Mas Catejar de Pontos, in Catalonia, in uh, northern northeast Spain there. And it's, it, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It's, it's this tiny chapel that the archaeologist on site there, and she's been there since 1990, by the way, uh, Enriqueta Pons, she refers to this um, archaeological site as a, a domestic chapel. There's this ritual chapel, this ritual sanctuary, in the middle of the site where there was a clear Greek presence uh, because there's a, there's a, a well-known colony for, uh, on, on the coast to the east called Emporion, a uh, famous Greek colony from antiquity that I'd never heard of or, or paid much attention to until a few years ago. Uh, but turns out uh, there was this Greek community who went inland. They are involved in this settlement and they're setting up something that looks like the mysteries. 
You know, we, we find uh, terracotta heads that resemble Demeter and Persephone. We find an altar of pentelic marble in this sanctuary, uh, the kind of marble that could only have originated at Mount Pentelicus in Greece itself. We find bell-shaped craters, uh, wine containers, showing a parade, a drunken parade for Dionysus, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's, this place is just swimming with the Greek mysteries. And in addition, she, uh, she winds up finding in the mid 90s, a little chalice about this big, two inches big, uh, which is in the shape of a very Greek shape called a kantharos. And it's essentially the shape of the cup that was only used by the god Dionysus when drinking. It's a, it's a little a cup with two handles coming out of either side. Uh, so uh, the point being, it's not a pint glass. It's a shot glass. Why would a shot glass be left in this sanctuary? Well, they were drinking from it. Uh, turns out they were drinking beer. So Enriqueta enlisted the help of her colleague, Jordi Treserras, at the University of Barcelona, who had access to a really impressive suite of equipment. And he subjected this chassel to um, a scanning electron microscope and optical microscopy. And I'm not gonna bore you with the rest, but they find beer. And they don't just find the residues of beer in essentially a shot glass, which should you know, raise question marks almost immediately. They find the remains of ergot, the organic remains of ergot in this tiny chapel. And so there in the middle of nowhere where nobody's expecting it and nobody's looking, we have organic evidence for ergotized beer that by the way, goes back more than 20 years. And the only reason people never heard of it is because Enriqueta publishes her findings in Catalan, in a giant monograph in Catalan, not a widely spoken language. And Jordi, I think he writes about it maybe once uh, in, in a journal I found from the year 2000, but it's just not widely reported for one reason or another. And it sits there for, for 20 years. It's just, it's absolutely extraordinary. And what was, you got to uh, show Ruck this evidence, right? What was his reaction? <laughs> that was a great day. Uh, he's very, he sat there for an hour looking at this thing and he's very pensive. Uh, and I say, Carl, you're, you're killing me. Like, what do you, what do you, what do you think of this thing? And eventually, um, it's funny, I, I read it in the book word for word as he says it. And he's, you know, he's, he's such a brilliant guy. I mean, he, he talks the way that, you know, you, you write if you focus your attention. I mean, if you spend an hour, you couldn't have written something that came out of his, out of his mouth extemporaneously. It was beautiful. So I won't try and paraphrase him, but he says essentially what I told you about the shape of the cup essentially says it all. And the size of the cup is indicative of the fact that this, whatever was happening in this sanctuary was not a cocktail party. Uh, you know, this, it's not the kind of cup that lends itself well to a party. There was something sacred, ritualistic about this container, obviously something sacred about what was in it, um, given the environment. And he says it seems to support the idea that, you know, uh, some kind of mystery tradition was being celebrated uh, for Demeter and Persephone, because all the clues are there. And he, you know, I ask him, so what does this mean? What, is, what does this actually mean for the history of Western civilization? And he says something about, you know, we ought to um, not be embarrassed by it, ask more questions, and essentially come to terms with this irrational component that seems to have helped fuel the mysteries, at least in, in Iberia. The big question we have left to answer is the relationship from there back to Greece and Eleusis, um, which is ripe for investigation. Right. And so, yeah, as you say, I mean, this is in on the Iberian Peninsula rather than in, in Greece. But I guess we, we have this image of it being part of the Greek world, right? And also maybe uh, I've heard you talk about this almost being like ayahuasca tourism today, where some people can't afford to go all the way to Peru. Um, and, you know, so things pop up locally, right, in Europe and North America. And it makes sense that, that this Greek mystery tradition would, would pop up in places outside of Greece in the Greek speaking world. It, it does. And, and I, I make sure to uh, include a couple scholars who write about that in my, in my chapter seven. This isn't my idea. Uh, it, it's, it's a relatively unknown site to this day, Mas Castellar de Pontos, but I think it's fair to say the Greek influence is undeniable. I think that's a very fair word. Uh, and looking to other scholars too, the, the very few who've taken a look at this, but they point to, back to your original intuition, about the fertility rights of Demeter and Persephone, they point to those as the kind of rights that would have been co-opted or adopted by the indigenous local community 
in Iberia because it's just so, um, how do you say, like primordial or chthonic, he would say, using a Greek word, that this idea of tapping into the metaphysical forces of nature, mother nature is seemingly universal and seemingly very, very archaic. And so they're the kinds of Greek rites that would have made sense to a local Iberian population. One who you're right, could not afford to trek all the way to Eleusis 2,200 years ago. This site, date, this site dates to the second century BC. Uh, it's not that easy to get to Eleusis from Iberia in the second century BC. Uh, so there are others, uh, Denis Dimitriou is it, who refers to this as potentially an open access sanctuary. So a place where the formalities of cult uh, were not quite present and folks weren't looking over your shoulder trying to control what in Greece, by the way, would have been an absolute sacrilege, uh, celebrating these, these mysteries outside the temple at Eleusis. It was a, it was a sacrilege. And so, but maybe here uh, we can see elements of, of that happening. Right. And you mentioned this seems likely that, well, plausible that this might be a very archaic practice, you know, all the way from the Stone Age through to the time of Jesus. You have this brewing and perhaps, you know, using psychoactive plants in, in the process. And also, I guess, the idea of witches, right? You write about as well, medicine women being this being a kind of a tradition kept by women who, who brew these potions. Um, and you know, Demeter and Persephone, these female goddesses, as he, and in all these different places, right? It seems to pop up again and again that this is some tradition linked to, to women. Again, which I wasn't looking for, uh, not something I was trying to prove, but again, one of the, that great conversation I have with Martin Zarnkel, I mean, this story begins 12,000 years ago when he talks about the, the fungi uh, and other present on the, on the, the human microbiome. Uh, brewing was always the women's art. In antiquity and I think we, we can say safely in prehistory as well and it carries on through the Neolithic into the Bronze Age into the classical period when Eleusis itself was um, initiation was restricted to women it was a women's rite of initiation before men were allowed in same with the, with the Dionysian mysteries I mentioned although we're talking about a, a separate sacrament of wine it was always women who are depicted and portrayed mixing plants and herbs and toxins into the wine that would become the sacrament for those mysteries. Uh, so from prehistory to Eleusis to, to the Dionysian mysteries, women, it's women who are always involved in the preparation of these sacraments. And, and Ruck has one of these beautiful phrases for it. He calls the secret of secrets in the road to Eleusis. It's this concept that these hidden ingredients and secret recipes would be passed down from mother to daughter for generations and generations. Um, in the absence of the written word, by the way, uh, Again, nothing is written down um, in the Dionysian or the Eleusinian mysteries, not to speak of the prehistoric mysteries before them. And so how would that have happened? It had to be this really um, tight, this tight oral tradition that bound these women together with what can only be called a, a sacred knowledge, this, 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 uh, this sacred pharmacopoeia that seems to have survived. And I want to find more scientific evidence for it, but what a, what a beautiful hypothesis, the secret of secrets. Right. And so you have this historical through line from these beers through to, you mentioned Dionysus and wine in ancient Greece up to the Christian sacrament. So if we turn next to the spiked wines, right, you, um, there's one passage here you write about how, um, you know, these, these wines are supposed to be, uh, you know, truly mind altering, yet yeast, you say, dyes around 50% alcohol. So it can't be, it's not possible to, to, to just brew wine that's incredibly alcoholic. It just, it just doesn't work that way pharmacologically. Um, and you also point out that there's no Greek word for alcohol, right? So it doesn't seem to be about the, just drinking an intoxicating substance based on alcohol. Right. I call it the most overlooked question of the past 2000 years. You know, everyone has this, this image of Da Vinci's Last Supper and the 12 dudes and Jesus assembled around this table with wine. But, and, and, you know, all this wine is dispensed in the Catholic mass and, and the Orthodox mass and different Protestant churches today to the tune of a couple billion people every Sunday and several days in between. And all this wine is flowing. We, even today, all this wine is still flowing. Here's the question, what kind of wine was it? What kind of wine are we talking about? Why do we assume that the wine of today resembled in any way the wine of antiquity? The second you start looking at it, the wine of antiquity is very, very different from what's in your cellar today. Um, like you mentioned, there's no word for alcohol in, in ancient Greek. And so whatever magical power 
the wine of the time had, it didn't have anything to do with um, the fermented grapes. Uh, it, and again, when you start looking into the literature beyond the, the science, but just looking at the literature like Dioscorides, who I mentioned a lot from the first century AD, uh, not only because it's one of the most durable manuscripts that ever survives, his Materia Medica, but he's writing at the exact same time as the Gospels. So we, we, we can't assume this, this knowledge wasn't known around the Mediterranean, but Dioscorides himself, uh, the father of drugs, in just one book has like 56 detailed recipes for spiking wine with all kinds of things and largely for medicinal benefit, I would assume. Uh, but then there are other things he's writing about in there. Uh, like Black Nightshade, and I don't know what Black Nightshade he's referring to, uh, uh, but it's, uh, he describes it in Greek as producing fantasias u aedais, which is not unpleasant visions. So Dioscorides uh, in the first century AD is essentially talking about psychedelic wine uh, and mixing wine with lots of other visionary compounds, by the way, like henbane and mandrake and all these witchy nightshade plants. Uh, so the technology was there, the knowledge was there, and again, the only missing piece of the puzzle is what can science do to, to, to tease out more of this information? Because we know they had the capacity. And, and you say in the book that the archaeochemical evidence is, is basically, uh, it, it shows that for 3,000 years we've been adding these substances, like psychoactive substances to wine. That seems to be something where maybe the lawyer and you is, is, is confident in the evidence. It sound, that sounds, you sounded quite confident in that in the book. <laughs> I, I, I'm 100% I'm confident in the concept of spiked wine as a scientific reality. Uh, looking at um, Pat McGovern, who uncovers this wine at Abydos in Egypt as far back as 3150 BC. Uh, it's wine spiked with all kinds of plants and herbs. Not too long after, uh, depending on your scale of time, uh, Andrew Coe um, published what he called the world's oldest wine cellar from Tel Cabri in Galilee, the same Galilee where Jesus uh, is preaching the gospel a couple thousand years later. From 1700 BC, Andrew Coe analyzes these, uh, these wine jars in terms of not just wine, but things like honey, storax, terebinth, cypress, cedar, juniper, mint, myrtle, and cinnamon. Uh, and you know, so from, from the chemical perspective, we can very confidently say that there was spiked wine. And I love in that article, Andrew Coe himself talks about these and other wines um, uh, being emblematic of a very sophisticated knowledge of the botanical landscape. And he says that the, th this kind of in ingredient list uh, is indicative of their ability to balance what he calls um, palatability, preservation, and psychoactivity. You know, so when you look at terebinth, for example, like resonated wine, it wasn't just to preserve the wine, the honey, and the, uh, you know, I guess cinnamon or cinnamaldehyde they find could have enhanced the flavor profile. And some of these other plants and herbs and toxins could have impacted the psychoactivity uh, or maybe even made it psychotropic, maybe even psychedelic. And so I use these clues to begin piecing together all these leads, looking for more smoking guns of psychedelic wine. Right. And you mentioned um, in ancient Egypt, though, the spiked wine seems to have been, been a thing and there was this blue water lily where it was a, a thing that was seems they seem to highly venerate um and it's thought that they spiked wine with it. I actually prepared uh, a bit of spiked wine with blue lotus uh, or blue water lily um <laughs> to enjoy after this conversation I was going to drink it during but then my wife was like you don't know <laughs> what the psychoactive effect will be so <laughs> I'll wait until after <laughs> after the conversation is that, is that blue water lily for real it is yeah it's dried dried blue water lily. it's beautiful um but I yeah I bought some of it and I, wow. I put it in some Moscatel a few days ago. Apparently it turns it very bitter, so I had to get a sweet wine. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, how it, how it British goes. people love experimenting with blue water <laughs> lily. There's a, in, in my book, I mentioned the, the, the series Sacred Weeds. You have to watch the, the YouTube of, just, to, just Google Sacred Weeds. Um, I think it's blue water or blue lotus, uh, but just but check it out. There was an experiment 20 years ago where they, where yeah. they spiked wine with, with the blue water lily. It's fantastic watching. Yeah, I watched it after after reading your book. Actually, it's great. I think it's called Flower Power that episode. But uh, yeah, they seem to be having fun. So I'll see how I'll see how it goes and report back. Um, but yeah, so so you, you have yeah you have this um, tradition of spiked wine that maybe you know it's, it's there in the Mediterranean in ancient Egypt and then seemingly in ancient Greece. And you looked at these these vases in the Louvre. Was that was that kind of um, to see? I mean, like this came from Ruck, right? He would say that they seem to be throwing something into some kind of potion. 
Right. So it's, it's one of those uh, famous Ruckian footnotes from The Road to Eleusis. He talks about these, these old vases showing women spiking wine. Uh, and again, it's, it's just pottery, it's just ceramics, but uh, I find it interesting because, you know, it's, it's, it's always possible that the artist was trying to capture a real life mystery tradition because we, we frankly don't know a lot about the mysteries of Dionysus. We have the Bacchae, for example, from Euripides, which debuts in 405 BC, and lots of tantalizing details about mynads frolicking in the woods and sucking on the, the, the blood of a goat uh, amongst other animals. And so we have the, these tantalizing details, but not a lot of imagery um, on, on wine spiking. Um, and so, uh, you know, Ruck mentioned these two vases, which I was able to track down in the Louvre by reaching out to the curator. Uh, I refer to them in the book as G408 and G409. I have these two beautiful pictures of them. And it shows women adding something. I, I don't know what it is. And, you know, I couldn't identify the specimen. Uh, but clearly, I think the, the intent of the artist was to record uh, wine mixing uh, by women, by these, by these minads, uh, for, for some kind of Dionysian ritual. So then you have these, these Dionysian mysteries. Um, were they thought to be, have been coexisting around the time of the early Christians in the Greek speaking Roman Empire? That, that, that's my whole thesis is that, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't think that the world went to bed in 33 AD as Greek pagans and woke up in 34 as a bunch of Christians. Uh, the thing that unites these two worlds is magical wine. I mentioned a little while ago that if, if you really do read the Gospels and if you read the Gospel of John, in particular, he is talking about nothing else but an immortality potion. You know, the blood of Jesus is the thing that makes you immortal. It's pretty clear in John 6, 53 to 56. Just look, look at the Greek there. And so it's not unusual that uh, a few years later, right around the same time, um, Ignatius of Antioch, for example, writes a letter to the Ephesians, and he refers to the Eucharist as nothing less than the pharmakon Athanasias. The, the drug of immortality, right? The pharmacon, like pharmacy. Uh, wine was universally described uh, as a pharmacon for centuries and centuries, from as far back as Homer, eight, seven centuries BC, to the fall of the Roman Empire, with Christianity right there in the middle, where you have uh, church fathers referring to the Eucharist as the drug of immortality. It doesn't take too much to put two and two together. Uh, so uh, I look at this tradition as, uh, as something that could have survived from the Greek pagan world. Not to say that there was psychedelic wine at the Last Supper, that is uh, well besides the point. And what, what, I, what I'm investigating in the book is the, the possibility that some of these early Greek speaking communities around the Mediterranean could have availed themselves of what to them would have made sense and would have made sense to their ancestors, which is to say the kind of spiked wine that produces ecstasy. At what scale, where and when, I don't know. We, we are just beginning to piece these details together because frankly, no one was looking at this stuff for, from a properly scientific vantage until very, very recently. Okay, and then there's this link between Jesus and, and Dionysus, right? So you have the idea that Dionysus, you know, uh, may, there be, may be this kind of this cult around spiked wines. And then you have these Greek speakers and people like John writing to the Ephesians, uh, trying to basically convince them to join up to this new religion and kind of pretty intentionally sending signals that like, this is the, this is, there's continuity here from the practices that you love with Dionysus through to this new Jesus figure. I think, yeah, that's one of my favorite chapters. And again, this is not my idea. I'm just, I'm picking up on, on where people smarter and crazier than me have picked up. Uh, so Dennis McDonald, who's a fairly respected biblical scholar, wrote this book only a couple of years ago called The Dionysian Gospel. And it, it's, it's the fact that John's gospel in particular, which we know is very weird and very different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics, John uh, uses this language that is very, is very strange, quite frankly. Uh, and, you know, he uses uh, these symbols that are only found in his gospel, like the famous water to wine miracle at Cana. You know, we think of it as one of these trademark Jesus miracles. It only occurs in John. It's in, it's in fact the first miracle in John. Dennis McDonald and others would refer to that as the signature miracle, quote unquote, of none other than Dionysus. The concept of water changing to wine was not born in 33 AD or 30 AD. Uh, it goes back centuries uh, to all these traditions in the Greek world, uh, like in the district of Elis on the Peloponnese. There was this tradition recorded by the ancient sources of the priests leaving these water basins in the temple of Dionysus on the Epiphany, no less, January 5th, 
returning the next day and finding it miraculously transformed to wine on the very same epiphany that the church today now celebrates as the coming out of Jesus, this epiphania, his appearance, his godhood becoming manifest by this great water to wine miracle. And, and clearly John is saying, this is a kind of Dionysus. Don't, don't think of Jesus as this, uh, as this foreign uh, son of God. This is the same son of God that you've heard stories about for centuries. In fact, the first line of Euripides the Bacchae that I mentioned, uh, Dionysus is referred to as Pais Dios, the son of God. Uh, th these are not new ideas in the first century AD. I think what was new, and I think very interesting to think about, uh, is, is how these mysteries would have been received by these folks. Because Dionysus, unlike the mysteries at Eleusis, is seen as kind of a monopoly buster. He's out there democratizing this sacrament. And instead of this beer that's locked up in Eleusis for 2,000 years, the followers of Dionysus are drinking their wine in these outdoor churches, in the forests and mountains of Greece and elsewhere around the ancient Mediterranean. Now here comes Jesus, not only democratizing the same sacrament, right? I mean, the wedding at Cana is a bunch of drunk people getting drunker, right? It's the, the, the miracle isn't the beginning of the wedding, it's the end of the wedding. So here's this great wine God, uh, you know, letting the wine flow as much as can be, 180 gallons, no less, to a bunch of drunk people. And wh what's the message? The message is that these wine mysteries are surviving. Uh, and here's Jesus inviting it, not just to the forests and the mountains, not just breaking it out of the temple, but inviting it into people's homes, into these private parties, uh, first at the wedding at Cana, and then at the famous Last Supper. Uh, Jesus is saying, this is the kind of thing that can be celebrated at home. And so the mysteries go from the temple to the kitchen, where anybody can access this very sacred tradition. It's a really interesting idea. Yes, yeah, it's especially interesting with the idea of a psychedelic sacrament because it's inherently democratizing. You know, if you I think you write about this as well, if you can have the experience of knowing God yourself, you don't need the hierarchy, you don't need the power structures of the church. Um, and so it pits this kind of, um, you know, this dynamic. On the one hand, you have gnosis, direct experience, revelation through drugs and, and kind of, you know, being democratizing and women being the gatekeepers of that. And on the other hand, you have repression of both women, drugs, and the Gnostic traditions in Christianity, right? Right. And I do think it's ancient history. I want to be very careful. I, I do. Uh, and Elaine Pagels, who's a hero of mine, writes a lot about this. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to, to suss out what was going on. Uh, the, the mysteries are secret, right? So clearly, they're dying under the weight of their own secrecy. It's not the kind of religion that lends itself well to mass organized congregations. It's just that, that that's not what these mysteries were for. In fact, it's incredible Eleusis survives the way it does for so long, but it was only because of the intervention of the Greek state at some point. It was so well administered and locked up. With the mysteries of Dionysus, it's, I think it's clear why they die out, um, not just through the force of the church, not just the suppression of the church fathers, all of which we know about. The church fathers are writing about the, the Gnostics and stamping out uh, some alternative versions of the Eucharist, which we know from the literature, including Hippolytus, a famous church father, is describing as a drugged Eucharist. He accuses the followers of Marcus of using a drugged Eucharist and uses the word pharmakon, that same pharmakon that shows up for centuries. Uh, he uses that word to describe their Eucharist. So we know it's being suppressed. We obviously know that women are excluded from church leadership, uh, but I do think it's ancient history and, uh, and I do, and in, in recent interviews, I've been talking about the, a real, the opportunity for the church that arises here, because even though this psychedelic um, uh, sacrament, if, if, if you will, if it is, if it is a reality, uh, and if it was a reality in the past, there's an opportunity perhaps to use that same kind of technology. And there is a place for the church. There is a place for psychedelic chaplaincy to help guide and curate these experiences in a very responsible way. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you opened the book with a wonderful chapter on the kind of religious reformation that could happen with this stuff. And I think, I think that's absolutely a, a wonderful thing to be arguing for. Um, and then on, on this line of the kind of back to this, you know, women produ produ um, producing these potions, you talk about this evidence from, from Pompeii as well of this very strange potion with lizard bones in it, which seems like a very witchy <laughs> preparation. 
<laughs> yes, and that wasn't my response. I mean, that was Pat McGovern's response too. Um, Pat McGovern is another one of these uh, well-known archaeochemists at the University of Pennsylvania. In the first century AD, we find this scientific evidence for more wine. So it wasn't just in ancient Egypt 5,000 years ago. It wasn't just in, in Tel Kabri in Galilee from 1700 BC. Uh, through, looking through these archaeobotany journals, I managed to find uh, the hard organic data archaeobotanical data for a spiked wine, which is not crazy to call psychedelic because it was this, these giant dolia, these storage vessels discovered in this um, uh, pharmacy actually is the word that the archaeologist uses, Marisa de Spagnoli. She doesn't say, a, I mean, it's a farm, it's kind of a farmhouse, but she says pharmacy. It was a pharmacy specifically designed, she says, for the production of drugs because inside these wine vats, uh, we found the, the, the seeds of opium, cannabis, henbane and black nightshade. Again, very witchy plants. And on top of it all, I think it's like 60 fragments of, of lizard bones. I mean, things that just don't belong there. It, it, it reeks of something out of Macbeth. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I guess to bring it up to, to present day, you also write about through to the kind of middle ages, the repression of, of women and, and this, this kind of spiked sacrament making, the idea that perhaps, perhaps this has really been with us for a long time. Perhaps there have been um, kind of secret oral traditions within, you know, different within Christianity where there has been this sacrament that's been kept alive. And then in the 1400s, you have the kind of the witch hunt where this kind of revival of Gnosis is suddenly seen as a, as a threat to the church. Exactly. And I'm following the, the same thread that, that, that Ruck dropped in 1978 about the secret of secrets. If it survives from prehistory to classical antiquity, why not from classical antiquity to paleo-Christianity? And why not from there into the Dark Ages, uh, as, as far as the Renaissance. Uh, you know, I, I did try and, and tease out whatever I could from the historical record. There is not much archaeobotany, by the way, or archaeochemistry from the fall of the Roman Empire to the Renaissance. And I looked, and maybe, maybe we'll, we'll find some, and maybe there's an opportunity now to find some. Uh, but what I, what I did find uh, were uh, interesting historical records, including uh, in the Vatican at the archive of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith of women who were persecuted as uh, strega, uh, witches, um, you know, being uh, persecuted, essentially indicted for their knowledge of plants and for, and for uh, traditional remedies. Uh, you know, it's the line between medicine woman and, uh, and witch and uh, alternative Eucharist maker was kind of porous in, at the time. And so I found some really interesting records from the late 16th century about one woman in particular from Siena uh, who was indicted and had something like 30 different witnesses called against her uh, describing in pretty good detail her knowledge of different herbs and plants, including an unguento, a famous witch's uh, unguent uh, that uh, included lizards of all things. Uh, another funny carryover that that survives 1500 years from Pompeii all the way to the early modern period. It's just, it's, it's staggering that this continuity. Right, and you also mentioned the fact that there are psychoactive psychedelic toads as well. So who knows what they were brewing up, if that may have been involved. Um, but yeah, so maybe a, a place to end on might be the, um, you know, th this, this, I guess this tradition or this rivalry between gnosis, uh, direct experience, chemicals and drugs that might be able to produce that, you know, even, we see that even with the colonization of the Americas and the peyote traditions and the, the mushroom traditions there being kind of aggressively stamped out as these kinds of heathen sacraments, you know, um, there seems to definitely be a parallel there. And I guess almost brings us up to what you're arguing for that, that we don't need to see them that way. We don't need to have this, uh, this, this shunning of direct experience. And perhaps there could be some way to reinvigorate religion by bringing these sacraments back into it. I think so. If, if this is all correct, it, it, it's a big if. If these sacraments survive all this time from antiquity, including at the very heart of Greek civilization, right? At the very heart of Paleo-Christianity. It's a big if, and I want to spend many, many years investigating the archaeochemistry. But if this is all happening, uh, it, it, it means that the modern experiments are on solid historical foundations, quite frankly. And what's been happening at Hopkins and NYU and UCLA and Yale and Imperial College London and all these uh, leading institutions, what's happening today is actually quite historically oriented. When people 
and volunteers have these experiences that they describe as among the most meaningful in their lives, maybe there's something there. Because what seems to, to have that mediating effect is the depth of the mystical experience. It's the mystical experience, that encounter with the ground of being or God or whatever you want that is uh, indicative of the, uh, the clinical outcome on anxiety, depression, and end of life distress. I mean, these folks have this experience that um, at least assuages, if not uh, eradicates the fear of death because they're essentially meeting God. Um, I include a story about Dinah Baser, one of these volunteers who was diagnosed with cancer and had one and only dose of psilocybin. And she describes it as being bathed in God's love. And she's an atheist. She was an atheist before her experience and after her experience and still refers to it as being bathed in God's love. Now, if an atheist uh, is having this experience, what about for the faithful or, or anybody in between along this, this spectrum, right? To, from the very faithful to those who hate the church and have no faith whatsoever. I, I do think there is technology here that if used responsibly and like Eleusis, maybe once in your life, maybe, maybe just once, if you spend a couple years properly preparing for that experience, um, and again, on that spectrum, maybe your, your, your priest or your pastor or your rabbi is accompanying you on that experience for a couple years, um, there could be a really, really profound religious awakening that would draw people either back to whatever faith they're comfortable with, whether that's no faith or the world's biggest faith. Here's hoping, yeah. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful. I really recommend everyone go out and buy the book, uh, The Immortality Key. I listen to an audiobook and you read it yourself very well. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend that as well. Uh, is there anywhere else you would direct people if they want to dive more into, into your work? Um, I, now, I do have a website uh, that, that's up and running. It's brianmurrescue.com and you can see uh, this interview, along with, with many others from the past month, and I'll be uploading all kinds of resources and letting folks know uh, where this is headed, because I do think that there's a very, there's going to be a very scientific academic uh, effort to unite all these disciplines and, and to have a, a global conversation on what this all means, not just for the ancient past, but, but for the future of society and religion and medicine and pharmacology and, and the whole thing. And so I want everybody to come along and, and be a part of this conversation. Sounds great. All right, I'm off to try my first ever spiked wine. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs>